again. We are going to be in Job chapter 2, if you've got your Bibles. We've been doing a series in Job. If this is your first time to be with us in a while, or maybe your first time ever, um, we're about four sermons into this series through the book of Job, and I'm not sure how familiar you are with Job's story, but I think it, it's a story we can all relate to. Today we're going to talk about adversity. Um, anybody here ever faced adversity? Raise a hand. Yeah. Anybody want to testify I had some adversity this week with an amen? Yeah. Adversity comes our way in life, and so we're going to talk a little bit about adversity today and how to deal with it. You know, I think one of the reasons the story of Job is so important and so impactful is because it's shocking and it's filled with suspense, yes, but on another level and another major reason is this, we can all relate to it. On some level, we can all relate to Job and with Job. E even if you can't relate directly to Job, because Job lost everything last week, including all of his kids and his livestock and everything, e even if you can't relate to adversity like that, you can still relate to hard times and heartache and, and, and difficult things in life, adversity, when it comes our way, because we all have an adversary and just like Job is having to fight against his adversary, we have to fight against ours as well. Job, just like you and I, lived in a fallen world, and he faced tremendous adversity in his life. During this particular season of life, in particular, it was very difficult for him to keep his faith. His faith was, we might say, under fire, the title of today's message, faith under fire. And yet Job remains unwaveringly faithful to God, even in the middle of his great adversity. We're going to pick the story up in Job chapter 2, but before we go there, I want to ask, have you, have you ever heard of a guy by the name of Jim Abbott? Jim Abbott. Anybody baseball fan? Give you a hint. Jim Abbott, raise a hand. Really? None of y'all remember Jim Abbott? Jim Abbott, if you're a baseball fan, he played for four different teams in the MLB. I'm not going to give you his whole history. Started playing in the MLB in 1988, finished his career in 1999. This isn't some obscure figure from long ago that you'd never remember. Um, the unique thing about Jim, the hard thing to forget about Jim, is that when Jim was born, he was born with a severely deformed right arm. have a picture of him here batting, bunting, and you can see his arm. Uh, there, very clearly in the picture. As a kid, if you go on YouTube or somewhere else and listen to Jim's story, as a kid, he recounts and recalls just wanting to fit in. He just wanted to be like all the other kids, but Jim was clearly different. He remembers people looking at him funny, and he said even more than looking at him funny, he remembers people just staring at him a lot. He said, I would walk into a room or I would be with a group of people and even people who knew me were just always staring at me. And he said, I just wanted to be normal. I just wanted to be treated like everybody else. He discovered early on that one of the ways he could feel more normal and he could fit in a little bit better was if he started to play sports. He was a good athlete. Um, he was a strong kid. And even though his right arm was severely deformed, which made things very difficult, he excelled in sports. The good news was is that even though his right arm was a weak link in his body, his left arm was really strong. And his mom told him when he was very young that he could throw things really good with that left hand. A coach saw some potential in Jim at a pretty young age and said that Jim should focus on baseball and work to become a pitcher. And so that kind of became the focus of his athletics, and he took up baseball and started working with different coaches along the way, and Jim excelled. He said he never intended to play in the major league. He never really thought that was a possibility for him. His entire motivation all the way along his baseball life was just to fit in and be like everybody else. He wanted to be normal and just wanted everybody to accept him as another kid, and baseball was a way he found success in that. You, you can imagine Jim faced a lot of adversity and a lot of challenges growing up in the world of athletics with a right arm that's that severely deformed. But something incredible happened if we fast forward to September 4th, 1993, 
That evening, Jim was the starting pitcher for the New York Yankees. Every kid's dream. He's on the mound for the Yankees. That night, they were facing the Cleveland Indians at the time, and something remarkable happened. Jim Abbott pitched for nine innings that day and threw a no-hitter. To give you an idea of how big of a deal a no-hitter is, there have only been 323, as of earlier this week, 323 no-hitters thrown since 18, let me say that again, 1876. In the history of the MLB, 323 no-hitters. Nolan Ryan, I think, has seven of them. But, but Jim Abbott has one of them. And that's pretty incredible, isn't it? I mean, amazing that since 1876, 323 no-hitters thrown, and Jim Abbott threw one of those as a pitcher for the New York Yankees. I like Jim's story because it reminds us that adversity is a part of life. We're all going to face it in one way or another. But it also reminds us that adversity, no matter what it is, can be overcome. You can overcome the adversity that's in your life. I really, truly believe that with God's help, you can overcome anything in your life. And that's what Job's story tells us, right? So as you think about whatever adversity is in your life right now, whatever you're facing today, whatever you might face tomorrow, whatever you faced last week, I want you to remember that with God's help, you can get through it. No matter what it is, you can get through it. Look with me in Job chapter 2, verse 6. We pick up the story here. Job's lost all of his livestock, his servants. He's lost all 10 of his kids. He lost it all in the same day. We discussed all of that last week. We watched him work through that last week. And now we're going to pick up in verse 6 where it says this. Very well, the Lord told Satan, He, being Job, is in your power. Only spare his life. So, So what happened was, Job didn't curse God when he lost everything. And the devil comes back and says, well, of course he didn't. You haven't let me mess with him yet. And God says, okay, he's in your power. Only spare his life. You can do whatever you want to him. You just can't kill him. So Satan left the Lord's presence and infected Job with terrible boils from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery to scrape himself while he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. You speak as a foolish woman speaks, he told her. Should we accept only good from God and not adversity? Throughout all this, Job did not sin in what he said. The big idea for today, we didn't put it in your bulletin. You'll have to write it down. I'm sorry we didn't get that included for you. But the big idea for today is this. Whatever it is, trust God with it. Whatever it is, whatever that adversity is, trust God with it. I think Job and Jim's stories both teach us about adversity, and they offer us several valuable lessons. One of those is we have to trust God with that adversity. That's the main lesson around it all. But when our faith comes under fire, there's, there's really three things we need to do. And inside those three things, some smaller choices perhaps we need to make. The first one is this. When adversity comes into our life, we need to acknowledge it. We need to see that it's there. We need to acknowledge that the adversity is present in our life. It never ceases to amaze me how many people don't want to deal with or face their problems. It, it seems like it's just easier to ignore our problems, doesn't it? to pretend that they're not problems at all. I'm just like you. I mean, my flesh does the same thing. When there's a problem, I just want to ignore it and hope that it fixes itself eventually. But that never happens. So we do this all the time. I've seen people do this with their personal problems. I've seen people do this with their financial problems. I've seen people do this with their marriage problems. I've seen parents do this with their parental problems, which are always their children because these are parental problems. And they think, well, if I just let it go, I don't really have to have a hard conversation now. If I just let it go, maybe it'll fix itself. But it never does. I've seen people do it with professional problems in their careers, at work. I've seen a lot of people do it with emotional problems. They think if I can just get to Friday or if I can just get to my next vacation or if, if I can just get to here, all, all that's going to fix itself. Rather than dealing with the core 
of the emotional problems in their life, they, they just put these little band-aids on it along the way. I've seen people do it with legal problems. Certainly, I've seen a lot of people do it with spiritual problems. I've seen people do it with addiction problems. I've even seen people do it with car problems. Recently, Abby's, um, and I'm not throwing Abby under the bus here, by the way. I'm fixing to throw myself under the, abu- the bus. Abby's my wife. Um, Abby's brakes on her van were squeaking, and the first time she told me about it, it was kind of a wet morning. You know, sometimes your brakes will squeak when it's, it's wet. So I said, I ah, don't worry about it. Well, the next time I got in it, I told her not to worry about it. Next time I got in it, it wasn't a wet morning, and they were squeaking. She was like, I think we need to do something. I said, ah, nah, nah, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. Well, eventually, she took it in, and sure enough, she needed new brakes, right? Because I just didn't want to worry about it. But those brakes weren't going to fix themselves. And and we do that all the time with these different areas of our life. We think that the problem is, isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to just get worse. It's going to fix itself. We've got to acknowledge it. We've got to face it. If you think about Jim Abbott, I mean, he could have just ignored the issue. He could have pretended like his right hand wasn't a problem, but that wasn't going to make it grow back. Job could have ignored all of the loss and all of the tragedy and all of the heartache in his life, but that wasn't going to fix it. Instead, he acknowledged it. He faced it. Look at verse 8. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery to scrape himself while he sat among the ashes. Now that sounds absolutely awful to me. But we can see that Job is acknowledging his pain. He's acknowledging his adversity and he's trying to address it in the best way he knows how to address it in that moment. Sitting in a pile of ashes, scraping his skin and these boils and these sores with a piece of pottery. Church, the reality is this. It's impossible to fix something you won't face. If you want God to fix it, you're going to have to be willing to at least face it. James said this in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. He doesn't say hide from the testing of your faith or run away from your adversity. He says let God work in the midst of it to make you stronger, to make you healthier, to to cause you to become more mature in your faith. If you're ever going to be able to do what this verse says and consider adversity a great joy, then you're going to have to acknowledge that it's there in the first place. And on some level, you're going to have to get to a place where you can even accept the adversity that's in your life. But before you can accept it, you have to acknowledge it. Listen, I get it. The temptation is always to hide our hardships. The temptation is always to disguise our disappointments. The temptation is always to mask our misfortunes so other people around us don't see them and so we can even try to pretend they're not there ourselves. But when our faith is under fire, it is always best just to acknowledge it and get on with facing it so we can get healthy again, whatever the case may be. And whatever it is, trust God with it. Number two, you need to assess it. After you acknowledge it, you need to to assess it, assess the situation. Job is sitting here in the ashes, scraping his skin with a piece of broken pottery. And while he's doing that, he's doing more than just acknowledging his adversity. He's actually assessing all of this stuff that's going on around him. We, We tend to do something when we read scripture that's unfortunate, but but it's very natural and very common, and we all do it. When we're reading scripture or stories like this, we tend to think they just kind of take place in the amount of time in which we're reading them or talking about them. So for example, it would be easy for us right now to, in our mind, think that Job just sat there in the ashes for a few minutes. Maybe he sat there for 30 or 40 minutes, right? Maybe an hour. But the reality is he sat in those ashes hour after hour after hour after hour after hour scraping his skin. No doubt, in the middle of those ashes, hour after hour after hour, he's praying, he's processing all of the stuff that has happened in his life, he's pondering what went wrong, he's patiently waiting for God to show up and speak a word of encouragement into his heart, he's doing all the same things you or I would be doing. He's probably pleading with God to save him from this misery. As he sits there 
in the ashes, assessing his life in this moment. Everything that's gone wrong. And he's there assessing the situation. And it says this in verse 8, Then Job took a piece of broken pottery to scrape himself while he sat among the ashes, and his wife said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. This assessment process went on for a long time. Um, In fact, the Hebrew here is very interesting. One commentator maybe said it best. He said this. He said the word sat there in our, our English text is a participle that suggests more or less a permanent situation. One might actually translate it better by saying he was a dweller among the ashes. He dwelled there, scraping himself in those ashes. The idea here is that he's sitting there scraping and processing and assessing for a long time. Another interesting thing, ashes is a big part of of Job's testimony and his story. We're going to see it over and over in our study through the book of Job. But the very last word Job speaks in Job 42.6 is the word ashes. In Job 42.6, he says, Therefore, I reject my words and I am sorry for them. And then Job says, I am dust and ashes. That's the last words he speaks in this book. I am dust and ashes. Ashes is a big part of the whole thing. If we can, I want us just to shift gears a little bit here, and I want to make another point about the assessment process when we're assessing things. I can almost promise you that at some point in your process of assessment in adversity, somebody else is going to come along and want to help you. Somebody's going to come along and attempt to give you advice to help you with the assessment process. And and I want to encourage you right here to be very careful because as we can see from Job's journey, not even just from his wife, but as we'll see in weeks to come from some of his friends, not everyone is helpful in the assessment process. Here we're introduced to Job's wife. Says Job took that piece of broken pottery, scraping himself, sitting there in the ashes. Verse 9, his wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. What? Now, we can't be certain. The text doesn't say it. We don't get these kind of details many times in Scripture. So I'm going to go out on a little bit of a limb here. But something tells me Job's wife is probably not the leader of the women's ministry at their church. Okay? It's just a guess. It's not scripture. Curse God and die? I mean, I guess she had the insurance policy all paid up. She's like, get on out of here, old man. I'm done with you. Four words, two incredibly unhelpful statements. Curse God, that's not helpful at all die. Just be done. We're going to discuss this woman in other sermons in more detail, but the point here is this, not everybody's going to help you in the assessment process. So you got to be careful how you do this. We might call this dealing with our associates. How do we deal with the people we associate with that come in, be, them, be they our family, our friends, our, our neighbors, you know, maybe even a pastor or somebody else. We're not always right about things either when we're trying to help people assess things, if we're just being honest. I think there's four main things we, we, we learn from Job's story and four main things we should apply to our lives when we're going through the assessment process. Because we have to acknowledge that there are just people out there um, who, who aren't going to be helpful And could even be hurtful. Now let me say before we even get into this, there are people out there that can be helpful. We shouldn't just discount everybody in the assessment process. The trick is trying to figure out who's going to be helpful and who's going to be hurtful. And the problem is, is when we're in the middle of pain and suffering, when we're facing great adversity, church, the hardest thing to do is think clearly in those situations. And it's oftentimes in those situations that we can't see clearly and we can't discern well who the good people are and who the bad people are as we're trying to assess. So I think we need to kind of make that decision now and kind of set up some ground rules for our life for assessment. So the first one would be this. The first thing I would tell you, the first little choice you can make here is this. You have to decide right now that you're going to avoid the temptation to isolate yourself. You're going to avoid isolation because that really doesn't help anything. 
And and when we're under tremendous pressure and adversity and hardship and heartache, it's easy to want to pull away. It's easy and tempting to retreat and just go sit in your pile of ashes and grab a piece of pottery and scrape your own skin. It's easy in those moments to stop going to church, to stop meeting your friends for lunch, to stop going to coffee in the morning, to to stop attending things you once enjoyed attending. It's easy in those moments to just pull out of everything and isolate yourself from everybody else, but that's not helpful. Having some time alone with God can be good and, and can be wise, and we're gonna talk about that in a second, but we can't isolate ourselves completely from the world. The Bible says we are created to live in relationship with each other. And when we get outside of that, it's a dangerous place to be. We just need to realize that. We don't have time this morning to look into all those verses, but, but the Bible says you need to be in relationship with people, and that's even in the middle of hardship on some level, okay? The, the second thing I would tell you is this. You need to avoid negativity. You need to avoid people who are negative. When your faith is under fire and you're dealing with hardship, and you're dealing with heartache, the last thing you need is somebody to come into your life and say, curse God and die. That is not helpful. Nobody needs to hear that. Nobody wants to hear that. That does nobody any good. It's no help at all. It's completely, totally, 100% negative, and it's just going to make the situation worse. And let's be honest, we all know people, don't point at them if they're here at church with you. But we all know people who, no matter what, are always negative. And even though they might be very genuine people and sincere people, and they'll say, hey, I'm just being honest with you, right? And even though they probably really do love you and care about you, when they come to help you assess things in the midst of your pain and your adversity, they generally just bring negativity to the situation, and it's not helpful. So you need to be on guard for that, and you need to watch out for it. Number three, you need to affirm positivity. And I'm going to be careful here, and I'm going to stress something here, because this may not mean what you think it means, and I want to make sure you hear what I mean when I say this, okay? You need to affirm positivity in your life. You need to affirm positive people. Now, when I say that, what I don't mean... I don't mean go out and find people who will tell you what you want to hear. That's not what I mean. I don't mean go out and find people who will validate your sin. I don't mean go out there and find people who will just be Mr. and Mrs. Positivity in your life and lie to you just for the sake of being positive. A lot of y'all like to put your drama on social media. I don't know why y'all do this. It it blows my mind. But a lot of y'all like to put your drama on social media. And when you put your drama on social media, all these people from everywhere, a lot of people you don't even know, come to help you assess the situation. And some of them are very genuinely positive people, but they're just feeding into your narrative. You go there because you know you can find somebody out of your 5,000 friends that's going to agree with you. Don't do that. That, That's not the point of finding positivity in your life because that can really hurt the situation. If you just surround your people who are not being honest with you but are being positive with you, that's no better than a negative person in your life. Remember, the goal here is to assess what's going on and to do so in a biblically sound way. What I mean is you need to surround yourself with people who know and love you and will help you in love. That's why we tell you all the time it is so important for you to be in a Bible-believing group of friends, people, small group, whatever it looks like, ministry team, mission team, to have a, a, a group of people around you that are Bible-believing, Bible-reading hardcore, on their knees, praying, totally in love with Jesus, totally sold out to the gospel kind of friends in your life. It's important to have those people that you trust who can speak an honest word into your life in a positive way. Again, I I think Job's wife falls short of that mark. But when you have people in your life that can speak truth to you and love, 
that's a positive for you in these kind of situations, okay? And then here's the fourth one. You need to assert boundaries. You have to have some boundaries in your life. This is good for you all the time, but especially when you're facing adversity, right? You need boundaries. We see people all through Scripture put certain boundaries up around their ministries or uh, around their missions or around their friendships and relationships and things. But I want to encourage you to never be afraid to set some healthy boundaries, particularly in these times. Just a few weeks ago, um, I had another pastor friend of mine, a guy that I've been friends with for over two decades. We came into the ministry about the same time. We've never served together at the same church, um, but we've, we've been in the same kind of ministry for a long time as pastors. We're just great friends. And he's been going through a really, really difficult time at his church. And we talked about the situation at length for weeks. I mean, I'm very, very in tune with what's going on in the situation. And on this particular week, um, he had a, a big meeting coming up with some of the senior leaders at his church. And I'd been trying to be a loving but positive uh, influence in the situation. I'd spoken some truth into his life and tried to bring hope to the situation as well. And I knew he had this meeting on Saturday, and so about 30 minutes before the meeting, I just sent him a prayer, told him I was praying for him, and uh, told him I believed God was going to work it all out, and, you know, just to have courage and do what the Lord was telling him to do. About two and a half, three hours later, I tried to call him, he didn't answer. And that's weird, because he always answers. I always answer, he always answers, like, it's pretty weird that we don't answer each other's calls. And usually if he can't answer, he'll shoot me a quick text and say, hey, I'll call you in a minute, still in the meeting, whatever. I didn't get anything. Waited another two hours, called him again. He didn't answer. So this time I sent him a text and just said, hey, man, do you want to talk? And he responded with one word. He said, no. And you know what? I respected that boundary. He said, you know what? For tonight, I just need to sit in the ashes and I just need to scrape myself. I don't need you right now thanks for checking on me. You know, he didn't say all this, but I know his heart. Thanks for checking on me. But for, for right now, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to text about it. I just need to set a boundary around my life. I just need to be with the Lord. And good for him. It's okay to do that. It's okay to set boundaries when your faith is under fire. Having friends, family, and other associates in your life can be great, but there are times when you just need to sit in the ashes with God. And you need to set those boundaries. Or you need to say, hey, just a couple people can come in here with me. All right? So acknowledge it. Assess it. But whatever you do, again, our big idea, whatever you do, trust God with it. And then here's the third and final thing you have to do when, when adversity is in your life. You have to accept it. This is the hardest one. You have to accept the adversity. Job... Job gets there in his life, and, and again, this is the amazing part about his story that, that we all look at and go, how'd this guy do this? In verse 10, we see that Job somehow, in some way, is able to accept that this is God's good and perfect plan for his life. He doesn't understand it. He's not happy about it. He can't make sense of it. You don't see any excitement in his words about this. But you do see that he has found a way to accept it. And I think it's so important. Look at verse 10. He says, you speak as a foolish woman speaks. Now, this isn't a good way to talk to your wife. Don't say Job said it. Don't say it's in the Bible, okay? <laughs> this isn't a sermon about marriage. This isn't a book about marriage. Don't take any marriage advice from what's going on here. You speak as a foolish woman speaks, he told her. But then listen to this. Should we accept good from God and not adversity? And throughout all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Job gets a little short with his wife here. And some have suggested that things weren't good in their marriage. And they read a lot into all of this little exchange. I mean, she did say, curse God and die. <laughs> and he's like, shut up. You're speaking as a foolish woman. Like, I don't It's pretty tense. I really don't know what their relationship was like, but I'm just going to err on the side of grace here and be generous with my interpretation, okay? Because I know this from my own experience. When your faith is under fire, when you're going through adversity, like I can't even imagine this kind of adversity that Job's going through, but I know when your faith is under fire and you're under adversity, 
and you're facing this kind of affliction, when the pressure is on and the pain is high, sometimes that leads us to say things we wouldn't normally say or do things we wouldn't normally do. Amen? So I don't want to read too much into this exchange, but what I do want us to look at is how Job accepts everything that's happened. Should we accept only good from God and not adversity? Throughout all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Job clearly trusts and is willing to accept whatever God has planned for his life. And that's amazing. In fact, it's astounding whenever you consider all that has happened to him so far. And you might be saying, well, man, I don't, I don't think I could do that. I'll admit, I don't know that I could do that. I don't, I don't think any of us think we could do that because this is hard. But we see from Job's testimony that it is possible. And I think this one big hard thing of accepting, accepting God's plan, his good and perfect plan for our lives can be made a little bit easier if we break it down into like four smaller choices. The first one of those is this. We have to affirm God's promises in our life. We should do this every day, but particularly when adversity is hitting us. We have to affirm the promises of God. Another way to say that would be to affirm the word of God in your life, which is why I tell you all the time, read God's word every day. Not just when things are hard, but read it all the time. God's word is full of God's promises. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, I have never faced any kind of affliction or adversity that God's word didn't address. I've never faced any kind of affliction or adversity that there wasn't a promise in God's word about it. So if I can affirm the word of God, and more importantly and specifically, the promises of God in my life, it's going to be much easier for me to accept God's plan, whatever that might be. I love what 2 Corinthians says. Paul proclaims this in 2 Corinthians 1.20. He says, for all the promises of God find their yes in him. Speaking of Jesus. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Sometimes we just sit in the ashes, scraping our skin, uttering our amen to God because we know the promise is there. My friends, in Christ, he's the him in this verse, right? In Christ, we're not just saved, we're safe. God keeps his word. God keeps his promises. When our faith is under fire, God is still faithful. And we need to affirm that in our lives. The next thing I would say is this. We need to accept God's will. Our Father in heaven is sovereign and he is good and we have to accept his will, whatever that might be. We have to accept that his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, that he sees the whole picture and we see but a sliver of it all. Even Jesus had to accept God's will. Do you remember when he was in the garden? We read this last week. It's a, it's a well-known part of the passion narrative. Jesus is in the garden. He's sweating drops of blood. He goes to God in prayer, in great agony, and he prays, not my will, but yours be done. Even Jesus had to accept the will of God. In Romans 12 Paul points out three incredible things about God's will. There's a whole sermon here, but I just want you to see how good God's will is. In Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He's writing to the Roman church, persecuted, afflicted, adversity. It is all over them. And he says this, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. God's will is always good, it is always pleasing, and it is always perfect. We need to accept that if we're going to have any hope of accepting God's good and perfect plan for our lives, particularly when we're facing adversity. This next one is the next step beyond accepting it, and that is to say this, we have to align with God's will. It's one thing to accept God's will. It's one thing to say, okay, I believe God has a, a good, perfect, and pleasing 
will for my life and his will is good. It's one thing to accept that, but the step beyond that that many people never take is to align their lives with God's will. Many people accept God's will, but far fewer are willing to allow their lives to align with God's will. When Job says, should we accept only good from God and not adversity, he's not just accepting God's will, he's submitting to God's will. He's submitting to it and saying, I'm willing to allow my life to align with God's will. Even if that means suffering and pain and affliction and adversity, I'm gonna align my life with God's will. In essence, what Job is saying here is, I want to be inside the will of God. And if it's God's will to have me in the middle of a pile of ashes, scraping my raw skin with a piece of broken pottery, I would rather be there in the middle of God's will than outside of it and everything be perfect in my life. He's saying, I don't just want to accept it, I want to align with it. And when our faith is under fire, and, and you've already got your life in a place where you've decided, I'm going to align with the will of God. Man, you have put yourself in a position to bring some major honor and glory to your Father in heaven. And then here's the last one. You have to anticipate God's provision. Job understood that God was willing and God was able to bring provision into his life. We see it here even in the early stages. We're going to see it more as we move deeper into the book of Job. But we're getting these glimpses already of a man who has anticipation that God is going to do something good. When our faith is under fire and we're trying to accept it, we're trying to get our lives aligned with the will of God, we have to anticipate God's provision. It was Jesus who said this in Matthew 10, 29 through 31, aren't two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's consent. But even the hairs on your head, all have been counted. So don't be afraid, you, you, and you, and you, and you, and even you, are worth more than many sparrows. Paul reminded the Philippians as they labored for the Lord in Philippi, again, afflicted, persecuted, great adversity. He reminded them in verse 19 of chapter 4, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And those things are still true today for each and every one of us. Accepting whatever God has is always easier when we're able to anticipate God's provision in our life. But whatever it is, whatever that adversity is, you've got to trust God with it. I want to close by answering the question you might be thinking, well, how do I know what God's will is? That's, that's a really good question. And to, uh, just to be honest, to answer that question more fully, we would need more than the time we have left today. But I want to show you what's at the core of God's will, what's at the foundation of it, what's, what the genesis of it is. Because if you can just understand what's at the core of God's will, then you, you'll have a great idea of how good and gracious his will is for your life. So what's at the core of God's will? The answer simply is this, it's you. It's that you would be saved and return to a right relationship with him. He wants you to be saved and to have a saving knowledge of the gospel. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 6 says this, This is good and it pleases God our Savior. Verse 4, Who wants everyone to be saved, it's his will, and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. God wants every single one of you to be saved. He wants everyone to be saved. That includes you. He wants you to be saved so much, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross so you could live, to bleed so you could be forgiven. It said it right there in our text, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, and he is the man, Christ Jesus. It's why there's no other name under heaven by which anyone can ever be saved. It's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. 
Verse 6 says he gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. The question really as we close is this, are you going to acknowledge that? Are you going to take a moment to assess that? And finally, are you going to accept it? I told you at the beginning, whatever it is, you should trust God with it. And that is especially true when it comes to your eternal salvation. It is especially true when it comes to the forgiveness of your sins. Whatever it is, trust God with it. If you have never called on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never been forgiven of your sins, trust God with it. Give your life to the Lord this hour. Give your life to the Lord this day and be saved. Let's pray. If you're here this hour, can hear me on the radio or on whatever platform you're on, we invite you to pray with us if you've never given your life to the Lord. We're not going to ask you to raise a hand or come down the aisle. We're just going to ask you to muster up whatever faith you have and come to the foot of the throne of God and ask Him to save you. The Bible says if you will believe and confess and repent, you will be saved. So if that's you, just say this, say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would change me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would forgive me that you would save me from my sins and give me the great gift of eternal life. Lord, I thank you for your grace and for your goodness, for your love and for your mercy. I thank you for dying for me. Father, as we close today, it's evident in a room this size with this many people and even more watching and listening that there's a lot of hardship and heartache and adversity represented here Lord those things exist on every single row filled with people in this place and I don't know what it is and and it's different for everybody there's 10,000 different forms of adversity in this room, Lord, but somehow you know them all and you're there willing to walk through them with it all. And so, Lord, our prayer is that whatever it is, we would trust you with it. Lord, I pray when we walk out of this place, we wouldn't just forget about what we learned. Lord, I pray that we would look at the life of Job and be willing to acknowledge that adversity, assess it, and allow others who love us and care for us to help us assess it. And Lord, that you would bring us to a place where we can even accept it. And as James said, we could consider it great joy even. Lord, we don't think that will be easy or fast, but we do know it's possible. If we'll take whatever it is and just trust you with it. So help us, Father, in that process. Bless those who are struggling. Comfort those who need it the most. Father, speak to those who need a word from you. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us here on YouTube or social media uh, for this message. We pray that God uses it to bless your life. If you don't mind, hit the subscribe, the follow, the like, the thumbs up button. Uh, Leave an encouraging comment down below. It's so encouraging for us to hear how this is impacting you wherever you may be. And if you have a prayer request, we'd love to pray for you with that as well. You can submit those by going to our website, cowboyfellowship.org. We pray that this blesses you. Thanks for being a part of our online family.